you could have testified under oath and perhaps should have. So it's hard to speak now when you don't necessarily have to be under oath. I hope you're telling the truth um, to speak out now, but not then. Well, uh, as you know, my lawyer was a very seasoned veteran lawyer, John Dowd. And our strategy was to show that every one of the conversations in the wiretap was in the public domain. And if it wasn't the public domain, his question to the jury is, why are we here? Right? So we were prepared to testify, but he told me, Raj, we won this case. He told you that you won the case? Prior to the jury's uh, verdict. Now, so you believed, you believed going into the verdict that you had won? Correct, because he was the expert. And I sat there, and the former counsel of the SEC showed numerous articles and numerous reports that showed that everything that was on the wiretap right. was in the public domain. So I decided, based on his advice, not to testify. Let me ask you about this, though, because one of the issues is there is lots of things in the public domain, and that was a huge part of your defense, which is to say that there was written documentation uh, of either anal uh, analyst reports or news reports about speculation and whatnot. But isn't it possible that that could exist at the same time, and this is what the prosecutors contended, that that could exist at the same time that these phone calls existed, and in fact that the phone calls ultimately actually carried more weight than the documents? Okay, let me answer it this way. We had an existing position in each of these stocks prior to the phone calls. Now, I would maintain that the phone calls were illegally wiretapped. The affidavit by Agent Kang was full of lies, and the judge ruled that the wiretaps had a reckless disregard for the truth. Yet he allowed the wiretaps. And a lot of legal experts were alarmed that if this happened, other Americans could be wiretapped. I think that's a big, big issue. So when you look at the wiretap through a dirty peephole, what do you see? You see dirt. When you give snippets of wiretaps in the courtroom, you don't give the full picture. And so I, I mean, the judge himself said, if you call your mother and say you're coming for dinner, it could be seen criminal in a courtroom setting. So, but, but just take a step back, which is to say, and I, I accept that you're suggesting that the wiretaps were illegal, but what I'm asking is, if we could put that aside for a second, the influence of those phone calls on your decision to make the trades. How important were those phone calls? Zero. As I said, I had a prior position in every one of these stocks. I listened to my analysts, and these analysts, it wasn't that they came and talked to me. They had to write reports. Right. Can you tell us what, I mean, because we've never heard your side of the story, um, very famously, uh, Rajat Gupta, yes. uh, who ran McKinsey, yeah. uh, was on the board of Goldman Sachs, yes. apparently made this phone call to you in the middle of the financial crisis, right when Warren Buffett was about to make an investment in Goldman Sachs. Yes. Do you remember all of that? And do you remember what he effectively told you? Yes. I know Rajat told you that he didn't remember it. It was a 16-second call, and I remember every second of that call. So what did he say? He was calling at about 3.54 or 3.50, just before the market closed, to ask about a, the, his investment in Voyager, which was housed at Lehman Brothers, and Lehman had gone under, and he wanted some documentation. So he called me when he got out of the, as I now found out, out of the Goldman Sachs board meeting. I have no idea that he was at a Goldman Sachs board meeting. I had no access to his calendar. And he said, I'm calling about the, uh, my investment in the Voyager. I said, Rajat, I think TARP is about to be passed. We had a consultant in Congress sending us reports about whether TARP would be passed. Right. And at 325, I got an email from the Cypress Group that was a consultant 
saying it looks likely that TAP would be passed. So I said, Rajat, I'm in the middle of a big trade. It looks like TAP's going to be passed. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of financial stocks. And he said, that would be good for Goldman. I said, thank you. I'll call you back later. After that morning I had bought Goldman Sachs, it wasn't like I bought Goldman Sachs from some tip. The morning I bought Goldman Sachs, I was buying Goldman Sachs, and these are in my records. I bought Morgan Stanley. I bought the XLF, which was a financial index. But when you look at through 30 people, you say, oh, Rajaratnam bought Goldman Sachs. Obviously, I increased my position in all these stocks when my consultant said TAP's going to be passed. Warren Buffett never entered into my uh, mind when I bought it. Let me ask you a broader question uh, just about the way trading happens and the way the public oftentimes thinks about Wall Street. They think it's a, a, that the whole business is unfair, that, it's a, a, that there's some kind of insider trading ring, that, that the access to information that you have, possibly, by the way, even from a consultant, for example, is different than the access that my mother might have. What do you think about that? Well, you know, we spend maybe 10 or 12 hours a day doing deep research. There's a theory called the mosaic theory of yep. Wall Street, where you take little dots of information and connect it, and that's perfectly legal. Now, your mother might not spend 10 hours a day on Wall Street. What I would tell her is to give your money to Fidelity or a professional money manager, because we spend a lot of effort and time analyzing, reading research reports, analyzing 10Ks and 10Qs. We get access to the um, reports of brokerage firms right. like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. So yeah, it is right. the public, um, if they don't spend enough time. Now, I am so heartened that with Robin Hood and the COVID, a lot of people are participating in the market. There's tremendous amount of information right. available, and hopefully lots of people will uh, participate in the capital market. But let me ask you about this. Uh, in your book, you wrote, if I am guilty, then the entire investment business should be declared illegal. What do you mean by that? I mean that if innocent chit-chat, you can ask me, why do you chit-chat? Because you want to know what's in the market. Innocent chit-chats, where no granular information of mergers and acquisitions or earnings per share are considered guilty, right? Then that's what we do. I want, one of the reasons I wrote this book was to not necessarily litigate my case, but to talk about this bigger social issue. This is a bigger than Raj Rajaratnam. I, but I do want my peers to read the book and judge me.